in the book of Mark. Thank you, Bishop Odu, <laughs> um, for taking care of the congregation. Thank you, elders, for fitting in. I'm glad. And thank you, all of you, for what you have done. Um, except that some of you have decided not to be coming at 8.30. Remind your neighbor, church is 8.30. And I will, <laughs> pastor is back, so next time you find me at the door, and we'll have a chat with you next Sunday if you <laughs> forget about that, okay? I will, I'll just remind you calmly that church is 8.30 next week, okay? Now, um, the, last chap- the last passage of chapter 4 is where we want to uh, pick it up from here today, and um, this, this passage is about a familiar passage. We have a number of passages on Jesus coming the storm, but this is a unique one, the first one. There's another one where Peter is walking in water. This one is not it. This is another passage where Jesus comes the storm. Uh, that day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious quail came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. It was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teachers, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Matthew uh, paraphrased that to say, Why are you so afraid, ye of little faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Lord, we thank you. May the entrance of your word bring light. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you all. Be pleasing to you now, for this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to talk about storms of life. It's a very familiar passage. The setting is the Sea of Galilee, although that is not mentioned. We know that Jesus Christ is his headquarter of ministries in the Sea of Galilee. He has had a busy day as we have been unpacking the last few weeks. Jesus came out to teach, and because of the crowd, he used to use the boat as his pulpit so that people don't um, actually push him. There would be almost a stampede, and to prevent a stampede, they devised a new way because of the way the crowd was surging that they get him in a boat in the sea so that people cannot come in. And so he's standing in the sea and he's teaching. Being the master teacher, he has taught, uh, um, you know, amazing truths of heaven using parables. You know, one of the amazing things about Jesus is that his lesson will not go over the head of his listeners, but it's something they'll be able to understand as he, he talks to them in parables that they'll be able to grapple, to, uh, to understand things that they are able to relate with. He talks to them about the seed that is being planted in hearts, and they are able to examine their hearts and see them sales. He talks about how the kingdom of God grows like this seed that is planted and at night it grows or the mustard seed that is small and grows to be a big tree. Such amazing truth. Must have been a long day of teaching for Jesus Christ and he must have been exhausted. And just like when we thought he was exhausted, he had time with the disciples aside now in the sea trying to explain to them the parables. And now evening came and Jesus says, let's go over the other side. The crowds are such that Jesus will not get any rest. If he was to come out on this side, he had nowhere else to go. He would have to go with the crowd that is surging and following him. And he he just wants some time to rest. And now the only place he can go is if they go to the other side of the lake. And he tells them, let's go to the other side of the lake. Let us go to the other side of the lake. You would have thought by going to the other side. 
side of the lake, Jesus would get rest. But as we know, in chapter 5, he goes there, and immediately there is this demoniac uh, who is from that other region, and he has to minister. Jesus' ministry was always on demand. He was always uh, pressed from all over with demands. It was not a ministry of convenience. It was not a time like he felt like I can take rest. It was not like on me, like I have to go and leave. He was always on demand. He was always on demand. And on this time, he tells his disciples, let's go over to the other side. And I can imagine the disciples hearing the master's voice, knowing that he's the Lord, saying, we have to obey the master. He has said, let's go to the other side. And when the master says, let's go to the other side, what do we do? We go. And they, they, they set out. And actually, it says, as he was. In other words, if you caught that phrase, it says, um, it says, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was, meaning he did not go out of the boat to change. He did not go out to come back as he was teaching. They just took him out to go to the other side. And when they were going to the other side, as soon as he hit, he hit the pillow, he fell asleep. First thing I want you to understand about come the storm is a calm before the storm, the calm before the storm. I want you to understand that calm before the storm, that Jesus now goes and sleeps. He says he actually sleeps in the cushion. He sleeps in the cushion. That's what he says, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were other boats with him. In verse 28, he says... That, um, no, 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 why does he say like he was sleeping? Okay, verse 30 says, Jesus was in the stand sleeping on the cushion. Jesus was in the stand sleeping in the cushion. Jesus must have been you, uh, tired from a long day ministry. I love this because it talks about the humanity of Jesus Christ. I don't know whether sometimes you have ever worked so hard that you really hit the pillow and all you did was to sleep. You actually even crashed on the sofa. You did not wait to go to the, to the bed. And you woke up probably at three and you understood like, I actually didn't go to the bedroom because I was so tired. Jesus was so tired that he slept in the boat. He slept in the boat. This was calm for Jesus. This was really calm. He had a long day of teaching. And being human, he was really tired. I love the humanity of Jesus Christ because he has to identify with us. He was human as we are. Bible says we do not have a high priest who have not been tempted as we are, but we have one who has been tempted like we are tempted. He knows our weakness. He knows what it is to be tired. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be even angry. He knows what it is to be frustrated. He knows what it is to like not make your goals. And Jesus was there in the boat sleeping and it was all calm. It was all calm. The calm before the storm. But after the calm before the storm, I want you to notice the calm in the storm. The calm in the storm. There is a calm before the storm, the teaching and all that, and then setting and doing the will of God. But then there is a calm in the storm. Now, one of the things that struck me about this is the fact that the disciples were in the smack of doing God's will. Talk of people who know God, will of God. Talk about people who are doing the will of God. And they are the disciples. I can imagine that they are now in the boat. They are like, we are obeying the master. God wants us to be right here. And not only that they are doing the will of God, but Jesus, who is also God, is with them. I mean, if there were people who thought there was nothing that would go wrong with them, it was the disciples who are in this boat. How can it go wrong when Jesus is with us? How can it go wrong when Jesus has told us to go to the other side? Many a times as Christians, we just think that as long as we are doing the will of God, as long as we are doing what God has called us to do, we will not find storms in life. Let me, I hate to bring the bad news to you, that even when you are doing the will of God, even when you are in the smack of doing the will of God, when you are in the middle of doing the will of God, expect that there will be a storm. Sometimes you ask, God, did you ask me to go into this ministry? Why am I facing so many challenges? God, did I hear you about this marriage? Why are there so many challenges in this marriage? God, did I hear you about this business? Why is it coming down? And sometimes we tend to think it's not because of the will of God. No, let me tell you, even when you're in the will of God, 
there will be challenges. The disciples learned the hard way because while they were in this, there was a furious storm that hit. Now, the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains and it looked like a valley. And because of the geographical setting of this sea, it is such that the, 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 the wind will come suddenly and unexpected. And so they did not expect this. And so the wind came suddenly unexpected and started hitting at the boat and actually even throwing the waters on board that they are nearly swamped. Must have been so scary and frightened for disciples who are already tired and just hoping to go to their side and catch some rest. But I want to tell you that they were with Jesus and Jesus is sleeping. Jesus is sleeping. Jesus is sleeping. How can he sleep in the middle of the storm? I remember one day, I was going to Trukan and we were flying from Nairobi and I've been to a number of flights, but this flight was like... <laughs> chaotic. I've never been to another small flight that was chaotic like this. It was so rough and so bumpy. And you know, when you get to a flight, you even don't talk to your neighbor, and, 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 and you don't even know your name. And when it starts getting bumpy, you just hold them, and like you don't even know your name, and you're holding them. And even some people started saying, let's pray in the flight. And then I am with my friend who is called Kit, and Kit had flew this flight to Lodu a couple of times. And this guy is sleeping. I mean, I'm just looking at him, and me, I'm scared. My, you know, the, the flesh is just going down and then regaining its hate, and I'm feeling like my, my inner parts are coming out of my mouth, and I'm scared for my life. I'm scared for my life. And this dude over here is just sleeping. You know, I'm like, what kind of a person is this? What kind of a person is this? And that is what we are talking about here. The calm in the storm that Jesus can sleep Right in the middle of a storm. I don't know whether you see that miracle. I don't know whether the miracle is the fact that the, the, the storm, the waves were quietened, or that Jesus would sleep in the middle of that. And sometimes I think I'm having that discussion with Jesus. I'm telling Jesus, you know, I'm in the middle of a storm right now, but I need to sleep. If you slept in the middle of the storm, please give me sleep, to sleep till tomorrow. And I know some of you here probably even German said, like, you didn't sleep last night. I am. Um, I, I was driving, I, was, I, I, was, I drove this way, I came with um, a teacher of Njoro boys, and he told me, like, last evening was chaotic. Every student in class was dancing during prep time, and we even had to take a roll call at night just to make sure, just to make sure that all the students are in. And this music was bearing and loud. Do you know how much the world is investing to get young people to do their things? And sometimes we are so mediocre in church, we think like we have invested enough, you have no idea how much it costs for them to put up a party like that. And we will need to up our game if we are to ever reach the young people of Njoro. I think it's a wake-up call. If we are to ever reach our young people, the world is investing a lot just to have the young people. But Jesus Christ was sleeping in this storm. And you need to have that conversation with Jesus if you are suffering, if you are becoming insomniac. And you need to tell Jesus, if you slept in the middle of the storm... I need to sleep tonight. It doesn't matter how the situation is. It doesn't matter what they are saying about finances. It doesn't matter what they are saying about taxes. It doesn't matter what is the report from my business. I need to sleep tonight. You slept in the middle of the storm. I need to sleep tonight. Jesus slept in the middle of the storm. And now I want you to see that there is calm in the storm. But the disciples of Jesus... We saw the calm before the storm. We saw the calm in the storm. And I want you to see now the coming of the storm. The coming of the storm. The disciples of Jesus, who are many of them, a number of them, fishermen. At least we know four of them who are fishermen, isn't it? We know that James and John and Peter and his brother, they were fishermen. And maybe a number, a host of other, <laughs> a host of other guys. Being fishermen, of course, this was not the first time they were seeing a storm. They probably had learned and were taught by their father, Zebedee, how do you deal with storms when they happen? But this storm was not like any other ordinary storm. I think God loves to beat us at our own game. God wants us to come to the end of us, to come to our end of our devices. I think it is telling that Jesus is challenging the disciples in the area of their expertise. 
that the challenge here is a storm when they are fishermen. I don't know who you are and what you do. Maybe God wants to challenge you to where you think you are an expert. Are you a health expert? Are you an expert of relationship? Are you a moral expert like a pastor? God sometimes wants to challenge you in that level where you feel like you are an expert. The disciples, of course, when the storm arose, I can imagine them saying, ah, we know this, keep it calm. We know what to do when there is a storm. We know how to probably fold our layers and we probably know how, what to do with the ship, how to navigate the ship to avoid the storm. But they probably tried everything they know in the book because our first resources is to do what we know. Our first resources when we are faced with a challenge is to do what we can, to do what our money, our pockets are able to do, to do what our, our abilities are able to do until we get to the end of it. Because number of times God wants us to come to the end of our devices so that we can call upon him. And for the disciples of Jesus Christ, they came to the end of their devices and they realized we have nothing. We need, unless there is sovereign, divine intervention from above, we are done. And I know sometimes we come to that point in our lives that we realize that unless God intervenes, I thought I was an expert in this. I, was, I thought I got it here. I thought I had all figured it out here. I thought this is the area that people say I am an expert. Then I am done. And they realized that they are done. And they went to the master and called on the master. It doesn't sound like a prayer. It sounds like a complaint. Don't you care that we are perishing? <laughs> it's a desperate prayer. <laughs> it's a really, really desperate prayer <laughs> that don't you care that we are perishing? Don't you care that we are perishing? One, they forgot that if they are perishing, the master is with them. He also perish. I mean, the accusation there that they are telling him like, don't you care that we are perishing? And sometimes I need to remind God like, I am in this with you. If my business go down, it with God, it's your name. That's what Moses told God. It's you who brought the children of Israel. If you don't take them to the promised land, whose name? It's, it's your glory at stake here. And they forgot that Jesus was with them. He must care because he's with them. He's in that boat. He, he must care. And never accuse God of not caring. The man who hung on the tree, he hung on the tree because he cared for you. If he never cared for you, he would have never hung on that tree. And if you forget anything else, never forget that the greatest demonstration of love, greater love has no man like this, that he laid down his life for you and don't accuse. And many a times when we are in storms of life, we are tempted to think that God does not care. There are a number of psalms that I would want us to look at uh, just very quickly where the psalmist actually think that God doesn't care. He accused God of not caring. Let's start with Psalm 10. He says in verse 1 of, verse 10 of Psalm 10, Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Sometimes it feels like that. God, where are you when I call you? Why are you not coming through for me? Sometimes it feels in our, in our desperate need that God is far away. He doesn't care. Psalms 13 verses 1. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? He is desperate. He's feeling that the Lord is not coming soon enough. He feels like the Lord doesn't care. And lastly, I think Psalms 22. Psalms 22, there are many other examples, but just let me just look at this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sounds familiar? Jesus was quoting this verse in the cross because even for him, that's how it fell. Why are you far from saving me? So far from my cries and my anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I find no rest. And sometimes it feels like that. A number of people have left church and left God. 
Some people have lost their zeal to serve, even in church while they come. It's now mundane because they feel like God doesn't care. They feel like if God cared, he would not have let the storm come. And like the disciples here, they feel like, why are you sleeping? Why are you sleeping when we desperately need you? Why are you sleeping when you desperately need you? And some of you can identify with that this morning, can identify with the fact that you feel like God is sleeping when you need him the most, while you need him the most. But the master got up. When he got up because he cared, and he is the Lord who commands the winds. He's the Lord who made them and put them in his place. He's the Lord who, who actually he does what no one else can, as we have sung this morning. He's the Lord who commands the morning, as says in the book of Job. He's the Lord who decides the ocean can only come this far. He's the Lord who ordains the winds. He's the Lord who does all these things. He just got up. He rebukes the wind, and the wind hears him and dies out. When the disciples thought they were done and they were desperate, I mean, this storm was such that they knew that their life was done. This was not nothing they have seen in their lives. And they knew if the master doesn't come through for them, they are all dead. But he just stands and his words, he rebukes the wind and it dies out. It dies out. Such is the power of Jesus Christ. That's the point of the parable or the miracle. Jesus is not doing this to be showy. Jesus is not doing this just to do another miracle. He wants to reveal his nature, that he is God himself. He has power over nature. They have seen him heal diseases. They have seen him cast out demons, but they have not seen him. I have power over nature. He created nature. Nature obeys him. Nature obeys him. And while I was reading this, the Lord was rebuking me that I sometimes don't obey him. It's like just a little child with tantrums trying to hit at the daddy and saying they cannot be able to do this. If the winds obey him, if the waves obey him, who am I not to obey him? If, if they obey him, I mean, they hear his commands and they obey. I can imagine how the winds bow down in his submission and said, yes, the master has spoken. And when the master has spoken, quiet. The wind just died out. I can see the waves of the sea that were rising just flatten out at his command. At his command. That is the power of Jesus. That is the power of his Jesus. There is a calm before the storm. There is a calm in the storm. There is a coming of the storm. And lastly, there is a storm after the calm. After the calm, after the calm, there is another storm. And I think Jesus let the first storm so that he can cause this last storm. And this storm is the one that arose in the hearts of the disciples. In the hearts of the disciples, there is another storm. The physical storm has died out. But now there is another internal storm that has been arisen. And this storm says, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Who is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. That Jesus quietened the external storm. That he may cause an internal storm in their hearts. They knew that he had called them. They had seen him perform a number of miracles. They had seen him feel the paralytic. But they had never seen him um, quite in a storm. Children of Israel, in those days there were, there were legends that the storms were caused by Leviathan, who we find in the book of Job, who was a great sea monster. And they feared this great sea monster because he was a great powerful monster that they thought nobody could be able to tame. Now seeing Jesus at his word quite in the storm, they are like, who is this? Who is this? I don't know whether you ever stand before God in awe and in fear and trembling. Oftentimes we miss to see his great power. 
The disciples had been taught from morning to evening. They had heard that the, the kingdom of God is like the seed, or, or the sower goes out. They had heard like it's a mustard seed. And these lessons, they had received them, but this practical lesson will have great effect on them. The, at the time that Jesus was teaching at the sea, they did not say, who is this who is teaching like this? But when they saw with their eyes what he's able to do, there was another storm in their heart. Who is this? The, the winds and the waves obey him. Let me tell you, church, one of the things I'm afraid about today is that we are too casual about God. We have lost the awe and the fear of God. We take him like he's just another person. Nobody have encountered him has remained to be the same. When Isaiah saw him high and lifted up, he confessed and cried out, Woe unto me! Woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips. When the disciples saw him do this miracle here, they are like, Who is this? Who is this? Is there a storm in your heart about him? Because the reason why he's causing storms to come around your heart is so that you may have a greater storm in your heart to realize who he is. When John sees him in the book of Revelation, he says, I fell as though dead. Don't be so casual with our God. He is able to do abundantly and beyond what you can imagine. I love the fact that they are now terrified as the one who can calm the storm. Previously, they were terrified at the storm. But now they are terrified of the one who can calm the storm. I want to tell you, don't be terrified about the inflation of this country. Be terrified of the one who holds the economies of the world together. Don't be terrified about cancer. Be terrified about one who can condemn your life to eternal death because cancer can kill for a time. Don't be terrified about what you are terrified about. Be terrified about the one who holds everything together. I'm asking you to transfer your fear from what you currently fear and are terrified to and fear God instead of what you are fearing. Because he's the one who holds everything together. And I think this calm after the storm is a calm. That we, is this, the storm after the calm is what we need in our hearts right now. That we need to be terrified and we need to stand before him in awe at what he's able to do. Then this morning, even as we come, we can bring our storms before him. I don't know what storm is facing you. Some of you are facing legal storms in life. Some of you are facing relational storms in life with your children who are, some of them are in drugs or in truancy. Some of them, it could be relationship issues with your husband, separation, divorce, cheating in marriage. And that storm has rocked your heart this morning. Some of you could be financial. Some of you could be about job loss. You are staring at a job loss or you just recently lost your job. Some of you could have recently lost somebody you loved in your family. And it's a big storm. There's one who is able to say to the storm, be still. And the waves and the wind obey him. It obeys him. It obeys the voice of the master. And even as you bring the storm before you today, I pray that even as he quieten that storm, another bigger storm of fear of God and reverence for him and worship of him will arise in your heart, will rapture your heart. Even as you wonder, who is this? The winds and the waves obey him. I don't know whether you hold him in such high regard and such high esteem, because the wind and the waves obey him. Lord, we thank you this morning. We lift our voice to cry to you and to honor you, Lord. Who are you, Lord, that even the waves and the winds obey you, Lord? We honor you today, Lord. We stand in awe and are terrified before you, Lord. What can't you do, Lord? What can't you do, Lord? And to encourage you in the next few minutes, would you submit your current storm before the Lord this morning? Would you bring your ways, your stones before the Lord this morning? Bring them before the Lord, even in prayer. Call upon him. He may seem like he's sleeping, but call upon the Lord. Just tell him, Lord, I, I know you care about the storm that I'm facing in my life. I know you are able, Lord. 
bring your storm right now before the Lord. I encourage you to bring your storm right now before the Lord. And you storm, hear the word of the Lord. He speaks and you be quiet. He rebukes you now. Be still and calm. And I pray that we may experience the calm after the storm. But even after that, we just want to pray that God will awaken the storm of fear and reverence and awe and worship in our hearts. Maybe you are too casual about God. Maybe he's just another person before you. Would you ask him to give you reverence and awe before you like he gave the disciples that day? Would you ask him like you don't see him like he's just another dude, like he's just another fella? Lord, we just ask the Lord, you may see you rightly, that we may stand before you in awe and reverence, that we may be captured by your greatness, Lord. We give you praise and we give you honor. Could you be here this morning and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and you'd want to, to do that? The one who, if the waves obey him, who are you not to obey him? There is a great storm that is gathering in the horizon, the greatest of the storms, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. There is nothing that can save you from that storm apart from Jesus Christ. And today, if you are here and you'd want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just raise up your hand that he can save you from the greatest of storm that is gathering. From the greatest of storm that is gathering. Are you here and you'd want to do that? Lord, we thank you and we give you praise because you are God. We ask that you may be glorified even in our lives, that we may continue to worship you in all things. For we ask this in Jesus' name.